organizer in Memphis, Tennessee, where I led several actions to create a more equitable and humane criminal legal system in Shelby County, which is the major county in Memphis by creating court watch program, youth participatory defense, and the reason why we are having this conversation today, creating the resistance against the militarization of local law enforcement through federal initiatives, as Judy mentioned, like Op Operation Relentless Pursuit and later on Operation Legend. First, I must say that the resistance in Memphis was absolutely an all hands on deck approach. And I wanna pause. I believe Alex Vitality is trying to get into the room. I know I'm one of the hosts, but if someone can go ahead and admit him, then that would be great. Okay, thanks. So I must say that the resistance in Memphis was absolutely all hands on deck from organizers, oh, hey Alex, activists, lawyers, academics, and everyday citizens who even in a pandemic were just abhorrently tired of the mistrust, the miscommunication, and strained relationship between the Memphis Police Department and the Shelby County Sheriff's Department and the local community. So you, you're talking about things like gang injunctions, consent decrees from school resource officers, macing elementary school students. Folks had had enough and they were ready to organize and mobilize. So after having conversations with national folks like Judy Green and Angeline Frazier Giles and others, Memphis along with the other cities who were selected for Operation Relentless Pursuit, who later became Operation Legend under the Trump administration. They began organizing even virtually to develop strategies to resist these federal tactics altogether. So the first thing that Memphis really wanted to do was to come up with a name to really solidify themselves and really formalize and position themselves as this is a Memphis initiative. And I'm gonna to go to a website that Memphis created where the other cities are linked in, but the other cities, they have their challenges. All of the cities look different. Every city has a different makeup, different demographic, different set of issues that they're facing. The first thing that we did to really resist this type of infiltration into our communities was we sent an open letter. The MPD, the Memphis Police Department, our district attorney and the city council, which now I believe it's garnered over 400 signatures. And in that particular letter, we laid out all the different ways that these resources could be used including creating more jobs, addressing mental health issues that many of the people in Memphis were facing, anything other than militarizing our local police department. So that's the first thing we did is we published that letter online and we sent it out and we were able to garnish those signatures. Then we also had a group of speech ends where we really wanted to educate community citizens, the residents, about what was going on. So some people had heard about Operation Relentless Pursuit, but others had not. So we really wanted to empower them through public education as they were having different conversations with their family members, churches. We had teachers that were involved so that they would be empowered to speak boldly and confidently about what was going on and what was happening right before our eyes during a pandemic. The next thing we did was we really partnered with the local press. Now I know that can get a little sticky. Sometimes you don't know where the press leads or leans on or if they're really for the people, but we were able to forge some meaning relationships with members of the press, whether they be our local newspaper, our uh, local news outlets, trusted blogs, um, influencers, activists, to really push that message out there about the funds that were coming into Memphis to militarize our police department. So that's what we were able to do. We were able to heighten the visibility 
after the education of what was actually going on in our city. And really the citizens really became empowered and they were placed in the driver's seat to really drive that uniform messaging. The next thing we did, as I said before, was we brought in trusted activists who were mobilizing since 2014 when there was an uprising of people who were just fed up with the things that were going on with Trayvon Martin and Philando Castile and Sandra Bland and so many others that were um, racialized violence that were going on in different neighborhoods in top 25 democratic cities. Then we also attended virtual and also in-person city council meetings. And we were met with city attorneys and also officials that stated that these Trump administrations would continue with or without community support. And their claims were backed with inflated statistical fear mongering by reporting that these initiatives were in place to keep the community safe. One of which the initiatives operation a relentless pursuit led to the shooting, not killing, of a 16 year old black male in Memphis, which was later found out to be a case of mistaken identity under these administrations, uh, Operation Relentless Pursuit. The final thing we did was we had a protest of about 100 people when William, William Barr and others from the Trump administration actually came to Memphis to commend local law enforcement for their dedication and cooperation of both the initiatives that were going on in Memphis. So they were really patting themselves on the back for minuscule things that they were doing under this operation and the minuscule arrests that were made under this operation. So what I'm gonna do now is share my screen and I want to go to, and let me know how I'm doing on time as well. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. All right, thumbs up. So this was the website that we created to drive everyone to kind of like a flagship place. So people would know once they sign our petition, once they sign the open letter, where can we go? What comes after this? What's the messaging? So we really wanted to show who we are. And this really just details that Decarcerate Memphis was the name that everyone came up with because this is what we want to do. The whole plan of these administrations were to incarcerate more Memphians and we wanted to decarcerate Memphis. And it really formed under the singular issue of creating resistance strategies against Operation Relentless Pursuit. And as we know, that's uh, a name that has been used, you know, throughout history when it came to Operation Relentless Pursuit, the three strikes rule, and other things that Judy mentioned under the Nixon administration. These are tactics that are deployed inside very vulnerable communities to be able to target those communities so that they are incarcerated the most. Decarcerate Memphis, again, as I said, was a coalition composed of community leaders. So it was a group of people that came together under this one singular resistance strategy. Decarcerate Memphis just exists to apply common sense strategies to community oriented approach to the systemic approach of policing communities, policing targeted communities. And as I said before, as the funds that were allocated under these two initiatives, we wanted to redirect those funds and redirect those attention, attention into things that could be more useful for the Memphis community. So as mentioned, the other cities that were listed in Operation Relentless Pursuit and later Operation Legend, Albuquerque, Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Kansas City, Memphis, and also Milwaukee. And I'm going to visit a couple of their landing pages. I know Detroit had one. Detroit's uh, coalition was entitled Detroit Will Breathe. 
and they led several protests as well. And I believe they protested for, I don't know, correct me, Judy, for close to about 100 days in regards to their resistance strategies. So when I talk about how different the cities look, this was their tactic, going out there, saying that their streets were ours. And as you see, you know, with a lot of activists, whose streets, our streets. So they really took that to heart and they protested for a number of days during the pandemic to really resist these operations that were infiltrating in their community. And I also want to mention um, a couple of things that were going on. I believe this was in Baltimore. Their biggest thing was surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. And I was actually interviewed by, by a writer from The Intercept talking about the different surveillance equipment that was being deployed into cities as a result of the funding from the federal government to be able to target different activists and advocates that were protesting against uh, the militarization of police in their particular cities. So Judy, I'm gonna pause here and I, I can pick up somewhere else if you wanted to add some more to this conversation. Oh uh, yeah, Joya, thank you. Um, actually, what I wanna do is uh, step us back a little and take a look at briefly what Operation Relentless Pursuit was uh, in the national context. But before I do that, I think if we could uh, if, if, if people wouldn't feel picked on or, uh, uh, or put on, uh, you know, on the spot or something, I'd like to do a go around briefly so that people could introduce themselves uh, to us and to each other, uh, if that's okay. And um, I think I'm going to welcome two of our, our close colleagues, uh, Babe Howell and Alex Vitale, and ask them to chime in to say just a bit about who they are. We work together in the New York City Gangs Coalition uh, and Alex is very much uh, involved with our work on operation on federal policing nationally. But, but babe, do you wanna introduce yourself and say a bit about what brings you to this, uh, uh, this workshop? Sure thing. Um, I'm Babe Howell. I'm a professor at City University of New York School of Law. I've been researching uh, gang policing and gang prosecution for well over a decade. It's kind of a newer thing in, in New York uh, to organize around gangs and crews instead of uh, stop and frisk, just stop everyone black and brown. We call it stop and frisk 2.0 because it really was like when the federal court said you're violating people's fourth amendment rights and you're violating equal protection by racially profiling people with stop and frisk they just moved this policing into the gang world and they call it Operation Crew Cut. They're, uh, they're collaborating with the federal, uh, the, the federal authorities, especially to target folks in the Bronx where the juries know the bad policing and the harassment and understand that a crew and a gang is not an organized crime uh, group on that note our, our coalition, the Grassroots Advocates uh, for Neighborhood Groups, gangs, is working to, you know, in a lot of the ways that Joya was just talking about, and reaching out to city council members, having protests, we are having another one, uh, a rally on Tuesday, you know, working with affected communities. Um, and my work especially is doing the freedom of information law request and you know, unpacking the prosecutions and the, and the abusive criminal justice system role in this. So nice to meet y'all. Alex? Hi, I'm Alex Vitale. I coordinate the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College, and I'm, I'm author of The End of Policing, and I work uh, closely with Judy and others on this effort, and actually Hamid, who's who's running a, a workshop at the same time in a different room, uh, Hamid Khan from the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. And uh, I just think it's amazing the, the work that's come together around building these coalitions at the local level. And we've tried to play a role in, you know, bringing resources, technical assistance, and coordination and these task forces, of course, are not limited to Operation Relentless Pursuit. They take all kinds of forms, 
you know, immigration task forces, drug task forces. Now Biden wants to unleash a whole series of gun task forces. Uh, and so this is one form that a kind of general pushback against over policing can take is uh, articulating the connection between local policing and, and federal support. Sean, you introduced Joya and me. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Sean Garcia Lays. I am the executive director of the Peace and Justice Law Center in Orange County, and I'm a visiting scholar at UC Irvine School of Law. Um, my focus is on public safety and really thinking about that in terms of safety from community violence, but also safety from state violence. Um, Devin, will you feel picked on if I ask you to introduce yourself? Can you unmute and say who you are and what, where you're from and what you're up to here? Um, sure. I, I apologize. I don't have a, a camera on my computer. But, no apologies. Uh, no apologies. Uh, my name is Devin Jones. I am a intern at a, uh, at a bank called Mercantile Bank of Michigan. Um, I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, I'm just here to learn. I'm kind of new relatively speaking to all of this information. Um, I was pointed in this direction by my supervisor again, who is the, the DEI officer over in Mercantile Bank. And um, I'm, just, I'm just trying to soak up as much information that I can take back to my communities and you know, try to just figure out how I can help. So. All right, Sarah Weaver, can you speak up? Sure, my name's Sarah Weaver and I'm a retired litigator a long time um, activist on the issue of gun violence prevention. And much of my focus has been going after gun industry members uh, for industry behavior related to firearms. Rachel Johnston. Hi. Um, Welcome. Hi, good morning. I am an intern with um, Community Advocates for Moral and Death Governance in San Diego. Um, I am finishing out my bachelor's of criminal justice um, virtually during the pandemic and I actually live in Oregon at the moment. Um, I'm returning to school after a very, very long break. <clears throat> and um, as I've done that, I've been um, really focused on criminal justice reform. Um, with the organization I'm volunteering with. I've been working with the Freedom Fund Project, working on bail reform. And I'm particularly interested in today's discussion because in Oregon last year, um, they federalized local police during protests because the DA decided to not charge a lot of protesters with nonviolent uh, after nonviolent arrest. And people weren't happy with that, so they decided to federalize them so they could turn around and charge them. So that to me was just outrageous. And um, I'm learning a lot and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Great. So Tanya Hilaire. Hi, um, it's Tatiana Hilaire. Um, I'm an intern for the Young Center right now and I'm finishing up my last year of law school. Welcome. Nalia? Hi, um, I'm currently driving cross country, so if I'm a little choppy, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm a PhD student at UC Irvine in the sociology department. And my research focuses on gang violence, um, policing in the US and El Salvador. Um, I'm also uh, working with the Justice Center in LA um, on a project looking at the use of federal RICO um, indictments against peace builders and the gang building in LA. Okay. Then Desiree Sanders. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Welcome. Desiree, Desiree Sanders with the Office of the Public Defender's Office in San Diego County. All right. So, uh, as I said, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about what Operation Relentless Pursuit was and what it represents in terms of what we're gonna see moving forward as the Biden administration takes us further and further down the road with 
the COPS office funding that allows hiring of, uh, of, uh, of new police officers uh, in cities and in tribal lands, uh, on tribal lands across the country, and, uh, and also this connection with the, uh, with the task forces, which is where the gang connection comes in here primarily. Um, so Operation Relentless Pursuit was announced in December 2019 by Bill Barr, who said that um, just happened to be coincidental that uh, you know they were kicking off Trump's reelection campaign. They were going to target seven cities across the country for a surge in law enforcement. And they were going to do that by giving those cities extra added money to hire more police out of the Department of Justice cops office. And then they were going to bring in squads of new federal agents to those cities working on the various already existing federal crime control task forces. And what that meant basically was that he was building a massive sort of joint task force that involved uh, the, the FBI, the DEA, the US Marshals, the Department of Homeland Security, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, you know, the folks who've been with you all along, but in this case, they were, you know, in some cities doubling the size of the, those task forces in terms of the number of federal agents that they transferred in. So Joya already showed you who the original targets were. The COPS office spread among those 17, seven cities, $51 million in COPS hiring grants to hire 200 more police allocated according to you know whatever their wisdom was about who needed what bureau of justice assistance you know the burn grant <clears throat> funding that most of you probably are aware of in terms of federal support for policing activities and technology and surveillance they brought in another 20 million dollars uh, including uh, near the end of uh, ORP they announced they were going to throw <clears throat> uh, uh, even more money uh, th th with half million grants to each of the cities to beef up their real-time crime centers. Now, the real-time crime centers, this is basically software that pulls together all of the electronic surveillance equipment in your city from, you know, traffic cameras and the and the, uh, the cameras that are installed in private businesses that have agreed to give them camera feed uh, and spot shotters and this and that. <clears throat> um, and the, the uh, most uh, um, uh, tr troubling use of, of uh, real-time crime centers is that they can stir that pot with facial recognition software so that basically it is a complete surveillance panopticon, particularly targeting you know, low-income BIPOC neighborhoods. So, um, and then in mid, um, uh, amid, amid this operation, when it was about half uh, uh, in place, Barr uh, said that he was um, uh, heightening it uh, and ratcheting up the anti-crime task forces to add three more cities and they changed its name to Operation Legend and added New Chicago, St. Louis, uh, and Indianapolis. Now, you know, these joint feather tax force, task forces are nothing new. Uh, all of the cities you're in have them, undoubtedly. They date back, as I mentioned before, to President Nixon's drug strike force uh, when he set up uh, and uh, um, set in motion his original war on drugs, which as we know, if we've uh, uh, you know, read uh, anything um, related to uh, Dan Baum's work on the drug war uh, was actually not really about drugs. They said it was drugs, but John Ehrlichman has finally, has finally admitted to Dan Baum that this was a way of targeting black communities and anti-war and hippies um, activists, which the Nixon administration saw as their enemies. Uh, so they could criminalize them, uh, you know, smearing blacks about being ha heroin addicts and with hippies, it was all about marijuana. And therefore they could, you know, bring down your doors and 
and infiltrate your organizations. And this was really counterinsurgency is what it was. So, you know, and I don't have to tell you that the criminalization, the racial profiling, the targeting of blacks and brown people um, for whatever they were doing, you know, has co continued. These are the hallmarks of federal task force operations to this very day. Um, the federal, the, the original um, um, uh, Bill Barr task force going all the way back uh, to 1990 uh, was he was the attorney general for the first President Bush, and he put a, a, an anti-gang task force network uh, in place in every uh, federal um, district, the Violent Gang Safe Streets Task Force uh, in every FBI district office. So you can see it was tied to gangs in terms of the rhetoric and the, the, the way it was sold to the public were going after these, you know, gang bangers in your neighborhood that are so dangerous, et cetera, right from the very beginning. Now that network has since grown to 160 local jurisdictions. And then of course the FBI operates 200 joint terrorism task forces. Um, and the DEA alone manages 398 drug task forces involving your local police and your local sheriff's departments in the unending continuating uh, you know, war on drugs long past the period where the public has become sick and tired of this war and has begun to actually legalize drugs in order to get the feds to understand that you know, they're out of here. Um, the US Marshals have 60 fugitive task forces. Uh, the organized crime drug enforcement task forces are like mega um, uh, multi-agency task forces, and they are regionally based. They're, they're uh, based in 18 large cities serving nine large federal regions. Now, I don't have to tell you about the, the, you know, the, dismal, the dismal record of these task force operations, because you've read about it for years on the, in the you know, front pages of the news the uh, excessive force, the shootings, mistaken raids, corruption. Uh, you know, these uh, organizations involve your local police. Um, they call your cops their force multipliers, right? Um, they swear people into being special federal agents, which then exempts them, your local police, from any kind of consent decree or uh, local ordinances or rules that have been put in place to try to reduce the level of misconduct uh, and and state violence, um, and uh, you know, and 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 so it goes. The the their operations are <clears throat> also shielded effectively uh, from accountability in the courts because there's now a blurred line about who's in charge. You know, is this a federal case? Is this a state case? And of course, federal cops have super immunities when it comes to their liabilities and so forth. Um, the, the, the suppose, uh, you know, raison d'etre of the cops office from the, from the start in uh, 1994 under the Crime Act was it was supposed to be about community policing. I mean, you know, that's in the name, community organizing police services. It has never been about community policing. It's been about expanding your, your police forces. It was the linchpin to introducing police officers into your schools. They funded most of the original uh, allocation of police, uh, the, the school safety officers, is that what they're called? Um, you know, it, it, what community policing is the name, the reality really is counterinsurgency. Um, and it perpetuates the same old stuff. I mean, as I said, uh, you know, how many people these days of whatever political uh, uh, background or belief supports the drug war? I mean, try to find those folks because they're, they're uh, you know, we have pretty much all of us finally been convinced that a drug issue or a drug problem is a, is a, is a, a health issue. 
uh, and a health problem and should be addressed appropriately. But these task forces perpetuate, you know, the, the, the policing techniques and tactics that were honed during the original uh, drug war, saturation patrols in uh, so-called high crime neighborhoods and tactical squads and no-knock warrants and, and, and I don't have to go uh, on and on to tell you um, what this is all about. I can talk more a bit about um, what kind of problems ensued uh, in the cities that were brought into uh, the Operation Relentless Pursuit, Operation Legend Network. But I think I, it would be good to stop here um, and to open up the discussion for people. I mean, obviously, if you have questions, but even more importantly, if you have observations, if you can give illustrations, if you can talk about how cops money is expanding your uh, right. police forces at what you see coming in the future, at the way these task forces have been marauding around uh, where you live, um, at the kinds of problems that they've caused. I will say that, you know, a lot of this funding is very strategic. It looks like, gee, the feds are just here to help and they're giving you money to, you know, hire more cops. In fact, th this money is a hook. It's a way of expropriating local police powers. If it's not explicit, which it was with Operation Relentless Pursuit, you get this money and then you assign cops to work with us or work for us. It's implicit. Everybody knows you're going to get this money, and then and when and if you cooperate with the federal government crime control agenda and 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 support the work of these task forces. And I will say, one of the most tr strategic grants I have seen happened last year in New York City when defund NYPD was really gaining traction. Uh, at the New York City Council. And one of the budget items in the police department that was supposed to be cut or was cut, who knows, was um, the police academy classes. I think they, they, Alex would know more probably or Bay, but I think that they, uh, they dropped the notion of two uh, academy classes. The cops, depart the, uh, cops office in, uh, and of course, I mean, it wasn't gonna be about hiring any new cops. We were, you know, we were, we were, we were downsizing. We were trying to, uh, to, to shrink the footprint of the NYPD. Here came the cops office with $11 million for New York to hire a hundred new cops. And now, uh, because these cops are obviously gonna have to be trained, um, the American rescue plan money is being made uh, available to the academy to train these cops. So I will stop there and say, you know, talk to us about what's going on where you are, please. Anybody just unmute and enter the conversation. Right, and to be able to, to guide the conversation a little bit more, thank you so much, Rachel, for giving us some intel on what is happening in Oregon. And I just re really believe the bottom line is communities don't need these federal programs. You know, they dress them up in nice bows and they give them little cute acronyms like the great program and the dare program and things like that. And you really believe that we need these programs in our communities, but I really believe the communities have the solutions they need to their specific issues and problems that they are facing. And many of those are health, whether it be mental health or physical health or um, addiction counseling type services. So uh, thank you so much for that, Rachel. And like I said, even though your city was not selected for Operation Relentless Pursuit in 2019 or Operation Legend later on in 2020, um, these names have been floating around many different cities and we're, we are curious to hear how that looks in, in your communities and how you um, have proposed solutions for them. Well, a new thing that they're doing this year. So last year in Portland, they disbanded um, a gun response task force in Portland. The police bureau has stated that that has led to an increase in gun violence, but there isn't really data evidence to back that up. So now what they're proposing to do this year is bring in the FBI and the ATF 
to create a task force, a new gun task force <clears throat> with federalized local law enforcement. Um, and the way that they're fitting it is, of course, that it would bring in revenue, you know, it would bring in funding and resources that local um, police don't have at the moment. And um, unfortunately, it is gained a lot of support um, because violence is always scary and people, you know, play it in the media, it's always um, a crisis. And so, it seems that they're not addressing any of the issues that have happened last year with the pandemic and why people are suffering so much. They're just rather bring in more federal authority to arrest people and put them in jail. So um, that's a little scary. Thing. Other voices? Thank you, Rachel. Anyone else want to? chime in about how this looks in your backyard i can share a little bit about the cops fund oh did i just cut somebody off no no, no go uh, a little bit about the cops funding in los angeles that was uh really challenging to navigate um so lapd had I mean, they play good cop bad cop with the community in the sense that on one hand you've got your old-fashioned metro gang units that are out there you know doing what we call stop and frisk in cars um, and everybody's outraged about that. On the other hand, they have the community safety partnerships, which are, um, you know, the sort of community-based policing that many people are asking for. And right, the way the funding works is all the federal COPS funding is used then to fund the community-based policing. Uh, and then the regular budget is used to fund the Metro and the gang unit. So one of the things that happened under the Trump era was, you know, there were threats that anybody with sanctuary laws was going to have their cops funding cut. And so LAPD sort of announced to the community, so here's what's going on. We, we're getting a choice maybe between having to um, get rid of all the good policing, the, the good policing that we do, um, or give up our sanctuary law, uh, but we're going to fight it. But, you know, this is where it's at. And so, uh, you know, in the end, 10th Amendment won out. They weren't able to take the money. Um, the cops' money kept coming in, which, you know, was then celebrated by many people. <laughs> um, uh, even people, you know, who, who would like to, you know, people who want to see less of the stop and frisk policing and if there's go whatever policing should be left over should be done better, right? Ended up in this weird situation where like, am I supposed to celebrate this? Um, you know, the alternative was maybe worse. Uh, it's hard to say. So um, I just bring that up to explain, you know, that this cops funding issue uh, has been taken, or can be taken advantage, it has been taken advantage of by uh, local law enforcement agencies too, um, to really defend the status quo, even while they're doing it by trying to say that they're doing the opposite. Anyone else? raise a hand or just unmute and speak up. Well, I'm gonna uh, end uh, this segment of the discussion here. Um, I think by, <coughs> and I have a whole catalog of <coughs> the kinds of problems that were experienced within the, the uh, ORPOL cities <coughs> during the time that these operations were in place. Um, but I, I, I just want to dwell on the most fundamental problem because it plagues us, it will plague us going forward. And it's a huge one for which we are hopeful to begin building power at the local city level to um, rein this, to really begin to rein particularly this funding in which is that your police departments, your sheriff's departments, your school boards, your tribes um, apply for this money without having to ask anybody's permission. And they're certainly not gonna advertise publicly uh, or have a, a city council hearing uh, on making application. Uh, applications are made annually uh, and uh, you know the applications are done right online. In order to accept the funding, however, the city has to accept it. And 
the way that uh, plays out is that it's your city council, your board of aldermen, uh, in a place like San Francisco it would be the Board of Supervisors because they, their county, but so their city, um, have to vote to accept. And so all of the cities we've been working with, of course, try to do what they could to block that funding, having to do it, you know, the horse was already out of the barn and here the city is, you know, getting ready to take 7 million, 9 million, 11 million in the case of Memphis. Memphis grant was 11 million uh, to hire 50 new police officers and put right. them on the street. So right. the cities, I mean, Joya can talk about the effort in, in Memphis was particularly poignant, I thought. Let me just say that. But let me say that, you know, it was bad everywhere. In Detroit, Detroit Will Breathe had gone to the city council during the funding process, got the city council to pass a resolution demanding that the police department and the mayor not apply, not to ask for the money. And it was a cross the board vote, this resolution passed. And then come December, 2020, when, I mean, the, mo the, the money actually comes later than when they announced they're doing the surge. So when the, when the time came for the city council to accept the money, only two city council voted no. The rest of them all said yes, even though they had told the city not to ask for it, not to take it. In Milwaukee, it was even more bizarre because when the vote came up, I think again, it was early December in Milwaukee, they turned it down all but two members of the board of aldermen said no you know we can't control this money we've seen what trump is doing with federal agents all over the country we don't want to see that happen here we're not going to take the money in january they brought it up a second time for a reconsideration and all but two voted to take the money and what they said was oh well but now you know it's the Biden administration. Of course, it, they knew it was, or they thought it was probably going to be the Biden administration when they took the first vote. But, you know, oh, well, now it's different because this is the Biden administration. We know that they will cooperate. They won't ask us to do anything that, you know, we don't want to do. Um, it is very, very difficult. It, it has been so far impossible. And in my own view, just my own, you know, perspective on, how change happens. Uh, this is, we're looking at trying to rein in the federal government only happens when there is strong action, resistance, opposition at the local level, because as they always say, all politics is local, right? And so we are working, and I'll say a little more about that before we close up, on trying to shut the spigot off at the federal level. But basically what we know is that the only thing over time that is going to shut this operation down and make federal funding available for all the things that Joy has talked about, which our communities really need if we're going to keep ourselves safe, um, it's going to happen with local opposition. And the feds will get the message when cities stop applying for this money or stop accepting it when it's offered. Um, so let's see. Let us go on. Joya, do you want to pick up where things happen, where I'm leaving off and talk about who showed up at your city council meeting when they were going to take right. a vote on accepting right. this money? Yeah, and I talked a little bit about that, you know, when I kind of start talking out the gate, but really, you know, when we attended the in-person city council meeting to resist and also uh, folks popped on virtually because this was the time they were also offering uh, virtual links for uh, citizens to pop in. We were met with opposition um, by our city attorney and other federal officials really sharing with us that this money is already here. And when you talk about police departments that are already underfunded and they're saying that they need support you know this was the easy acceptance this was an easy buy-in um, coupled with the propaganda that is shared from district attorneys that uh, say things like you should fear your neighbors you should fear um, your church members you should fear the community and we're here to help you so it's a very very easy 
sell to citizens to buy in. And, and as I said, we received a lot of support from people who wanted to know more, or as I say, take the red pill on what was going on in regards to Operation Realist Pursuit and Operation Legend. But there were so many others that were resistance to our resistance. They didn't want to believe what we were actually sharing with them. And I just want to empower everybody that's on this call, that if you receive anything, that these types of programs, and even in Atlanta, where I live now, you know, it's a program called Project Safe Neighborhoods. You know, this is still the same type of funding that cities are receiving from federal departments. It is your responsibility to keep an eye on these programs and not allow them to ride into your neighborhoods and communities like Trojan horses. And later they produce all this detriment of incarceration, of uh, creating a whole slew of other problems that were already probably not in your community to start with if these programs weren't invited into your cities by your city officials. So keep a watchful eye and be vigilant and responsive to these programs that come into your community. Propose alternate solutions as we did in Memphis um, and keep up the fight. So that's all that I will add, Judy. I think this has been a very um, well-rounded discussion. A lot of folks have added a lot of uh, information to this discussion. And if you haven't spoken in this conversation, I hope that you receive information from us. I drop my email in the chat and I'm sure Judy is accessible to be a thought partner for cities and also communities and individuals. Again, you know, we wanna open the door if people have, you know, questions for sure, but um, we'd really like to know more about what's going on where you are. If you have advice, if you, if you have lessons that you've learned from opposing gang enforcement and harsh policing uh, and uh, have ideas that we can pass along to the folks we're working with uh, in the cities where we are, um, please unmute and speak your piece. Yes, no? Well, I'm gonna say just a little bit more about what we're looking at uh, going forward, uh, because, um, you know, people have mentioned uh, already, I think that uh, the, the new focus at the Justice Department and uh, from the White House is uh, about, we're gonna be doing, setting up massive new task forces. New York is getting one uh, on guns. Uh, and I, I would say two things about that, uh, one of which is that um, they've been talking about how, uh, you know, more money is needed and, and, and tougher police is needed in New York forever and saying that it's about guns. Partly, I think that's because from time to time, certainly in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, we had a serious problem with gun crime, gun violence, mostly uh, from, uh, from, from young folks uh, who, uh, you know, really, uh, it wasn't a gang problem that was related, they thought, to the drug trade. They said it had something to do with the, 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 the crack market. In fact, uh, uh, social scientists in New York who did ethnographic research about what was going on with the gun violence in New York at the time found that you know, it was far from gang related. It was interpersonal beefs, not even, you know, one street crew against another crew would more likely take place at, you know, at a, at a party or some other social gathering where someone just got mad or some, someone moved on someone else's woman or, or partner or, you know, that kind of thing. But it gave rise famously in New York to stop and frisk. And when we were battling that trying to get rid of stop and frisk, ultimately, for the most part, pulled it way, way back with federal litigation. What the city kept saying publicly and privately was, oh, but this is really all about guns, you know, and if we can't do stop and frisk, we can't control guns. Well, if you look at the arrests, or number one, who got arrested in New York, uh, it looked pretty familiar to anybody who'd been watching broken windows policing from the beginning uh, in terms of, um, you know, you don't see 
white people at arraignments in Manhattan, for example. Uh, but uh, also, if you look at what, what people were arrested for, it was drugs. It was rarely guns. It was drugs again and again, and much of it was marijuana. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and so it goes. So I'm not saying that we don't have problems with gun violence in this, in this country. I'm not saying that we don't have an increase in violence this past year, whether it's guns or other forms of violence. But what we know is what's generated the difficulty this past year, which is nowhere near the level of violence that we experienced in the late 80s, in the early 90s in this country, violence has been steadily decreasing and is still at all time low in at an all time low in New York. Um, it's it's uh, it's going to be about guns. That's what they're going to tell us. Um, but the bottom line, you know, we already saw the feds make a, a task force move here in New York that was supposedly about guns, which is we have a district attorney in Brooklyn in my borough, uh, Eric Gonzalez. Uh, you know, who grew up in East New York. He knows the streets. He was a gang member when he was a kid. And then he pulled himself uh, into, uh, you know, an education track, uh, ended up graduating from law school in Ann Arbor, came back to New York, been a prosecutor since he landed back. But he knows the reasons why folks, young folks in particular, carry guns in Brooklyn and that much of it is got to do not with violence, but with protection. Because there are neighborhoods in Brooklyn where, you know, a gun is, 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 is the, the primary source of protection uh, because you can't rely on the police. Um, so Eric started a, because, you know, people convicted gun, gun uh, possession have faced mandatory sentencing in New York. So Eric started diverting them uh, and set up a diversion program so that people not only avoided a conviction, but they also, if they needed a service, they got a referral. Um, and, uh, you know, the follow-up data on this program looks very good in terms of, you know, you don't see people marching back in charged again in, in cuffs over guns or anything else so far. Um, it's working quite well from the standpoint of community safety. And suddenly up in, um, I think it was in Brownsville, pops a new federal task force calls itself RASP. And it's about guns. And it's about the federal, the FBI uh, uh, taking over arrests for people in that neighborhood in Brooklyn uh, who were picked up uh, with on gun possession charges for two reasons. One of which they're obviously trying to uh, uh, make everybody understand that the district attorney was not doing his job, but also because, you know, last year we had a, a bail reform um, the year before, a, a bail reform measure that was passed somewhat rolled back since then, but still, um, uh, which, which meant that these, these, the folks who were being arrested on, uh, on, on gun possession charges were not being held on bail. And so when the feds moved in, they made a lot of noise about how, well, not only you know, will these people be held in federal pretrial jurisdiction, you know, we're gonna get around this bail law. They were just completely blatant about that. Uh, but then of course, they're gonna, fa they're gonna face mandatory minimum federal gu gun charges, which of course involve years behind bars. Um, you know, Eric stirred firm and the thing sort of boiled down and we haven't heard much about it since, but here it's gonna come again. And this is gonna be the case, um, uh, you know, not just the first uh, five cities, I think, that have been targeted with the big new gun task force uh, efforts. And they're going to tell you they're going after traffickers. And when you look at the arrests and the arrestees, we're going to see what it always boils down to. It's the same criminalization, the same profiling, uh, and the same dismal, dismal uh, outlook. I have seen this movie. It does not end well. So 
we're going to be continuing to try to spread the word to try we are already engaged in an effort at the federal level but as i said action really needs to be local before the feds will hear us but we've circulated recently a uh, a letter uh, for sign on not from federal organizations or national organizations, but for local organizations and individual residents in the cities where we're working, um, which the letter got sent to the House Appropriations P Committee, uh, urging them to erase the request from the White House for 300 million more dollars to hire more cops in 2022. <laughs> we didn't uh, get very far so far. I'm not uh, naive enough to think that we're going to be able to pull that money out of the 2022 budget, you know, but this is where it starts. This is where you let the feds know that something is brewing out there. We, you know, that however long it takes, we're going to be trying to do what we can to turn this money faucet off and to make the feds understand what they all probably know, but they're just in massive denial. The police are not going to solve these problems, are not going to solve the problem of violence, are not going to solve the kinds of problems that uh, we're experiencing thanks to the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and we don't want community policing. Don't give us that, uh, that uh, pardon my French bullshit, because uh, we don't want the police trying to solve problems that police can't solve to begin with. Um, so people are interested. Uh, Joya's uh, email is in the chat. I'll put mine. But uh, again, I think uh, I'm going to wind down here. Let's see again, invite any other kinds of, uh, of um, you know, comments, experiences, questions, insights. Um, yeah, if, if no one has any other comments, you know, I always take it as as silence as we've offered very clear, concise information, left no room for ambiguity. <laughs> and uh, you are going forth and pondering on this information to solve problems 